there's been a lot of talk about DLL hijacking. So in this video, we're going to basically demonstrate what happens uh, when you do a DLL hijack. So uh, all I'm doing here is I'm just uh, actually loading up Metasploit. And we're going to use it, use a WebDAV, uh, WebDAV DLL hijack. Now uh, this is a fully patched Windows 7 box here that you're looking at that we're going to um, actually exploit using this DLL hijacking technique. Now, you know, there are other videos and other writings we've done to demonstrate how to do this. Now, essentially, the main point of this is you need to be able to get the victim to click on something. And these days, that's real easy. Now, there's several ways we can do it. Uh, maybe we'll follow up with another video series to show, um, you know, uh, different creative ways to get people to click on stuff. And all I did here is I just did a search for uh, WebDAV within Metasploit. And um, let's see, yeah, this is the guy we're going to use here. So I'm just going to copy that and we'll use that. So command is just use. And then I'm just going to paste that uh, name there. And that loads the exploit. So uh, just like any other Metasploit thing, we need to now set uh, some options in payloads. So we'll set all these options. Now, as I go through and set these, you know, the thing about DLL hijacking, this is not anything new. It's not really new. This has been uh, something that's been known about for many years. It's just that there's been new spins on it. Now, HD Moore has a tool that you can run on your Windows box, and it'll point out to you all of the uh, DLLs that are vulnerable to this attack. And essentially, you know, as we said in the intro text here, uh, what it boils down to is if there needs, if a, a program needs a specific DLL to run, by default in Windows, it's going to follow the convention of looking in the current directory first for that DLL. Now, in this case, we're going to have the DLL stored in the same directory that um, the user is going to browse to. And that's what's going to cause uh, the hijack to actually work. Now, all I'm doing is setting options here, um, you know, setting file types, extensions, and uh, things of that nature. I'm also setting my L host, which again is just my Linux IP address because this is where I want my interpreter shell to come back to. All right. So there are several other things we need to consider here. Now, you know, we can do show options here and we can see all the things that have to be set. Now we got to set an SRV port because we're essentially going to make this thing act as a web server and we're going to, um, you know, use Windows to browse to it via SMB. We also have to set uh, a base name and we also have to set um, a path, you know, or a URI. And we're going to use uh, documents for that. Now, again, we could use any URI we want. We could just use a slash and just store all of the files on the root if we wanted to do that. Um, and that way they could just browse to a particular, um, you know, web server. And you could uh, kind of redirect them depending on the web server technology you're using to a particular share uh, when they hit that root site. So we set our SRV host here. All right, we set our L port, and this is the port that they're going to call back out to uh, our machine on. Now, we just simply launched the command exploit to start the exploit. All right, so now, you know, we're simply going to end up browsing over. Let me just check our... See here. All right, so... And if you're doing this uh, at home or at work, uh, you make sure that you either create some IP tables rules to allow this traffic to come back, or as you just saw me just do, I stopped it. All right, I, I just stopped the IP tables temporarily. Now, on the Windows 7 side, we're going to go to our Windows 7 host. And again, this is a patch, fully patched Windows 7 host here. We're going to browse to, um, you know, that share 
that SMB share. And then we're going to launch um, a Windows address book file. Or try to launch a Windows address book file. And in the process of opening that address book file, that WAB file, and let's just go ahead and browse to the path here. But in the process of opening that WAB file, Windows is going to need to call a particular DLL to be able to load that. And it's going to look again in the current directory first for that. And we're going to find that those files are uh, located in that document share. So let's go ahead and browse there. Uh, documents. Yeah, that's right. All right, so now this is what happens when you browse there with a web browser. Okay, you get the actual web page. So we see that the web server is functioning here. Now, this is not going to exploit you. Now, there's another variation of this in Metasploit that's the web version. This is, we set the SMB version, so that's what we're going to use. I just wanted to browse here with the web browser to make sure the um, server is actually running properly. So now, let's go ahead and browse there via SMB. All right, and we're just going to follow our normal uh, SMB browsing convention here, just like if you were browsing to a Windows machine um, from, you know, this uh, run bar here. So what we're going to see is we're going to see the share pop up, and we're going to see the list of files in there, and then we'll just simply need to click on a particular file. And again, it's several ways to, you know, many ways, not several, many ways to get somebody uh, to this particular file that they're, that we're going to click on here. All right, so here's our share. We can see all the files listed there. Now, what we want to do is we want to open this Windows address book file or double click on it or try to open it. Now, there's a more advanced version of this that I'm going to put up a video for later where they don't even have to open it. They just have to look at it and explore, you know, it be in their Explorer window. So we can see the traversing happening here. And, you know, we've got a uh, Metterpreter shell just that quick. So now, of course, we just follow, you know, the normal uh, Metasploit syntax here, sessions-i1 to get that session. And now we're on uh, the shell on that machine. And we can now, you know, do everything else we've already saw how to do in Metasploit in previous videos. Um, and just in case this is your first time watching the video, we'll do a few of these things. All right, so we can get UID, and what this shows us here is we can see what the current privileges we have. All right, so we have administrator privilege or hacker privilege because he's an administrator, but we need to basically get system privilege. And I want to point out that that's pretty easy because all we did was simply type the get system command, and that elevated our privileges to NT system, which is basically uh, like root on Windows. So now, you know, we have privileges to do pretty much whatever we want. Um, so we could uh, do screenshots. All right. And uh, the interpreter shell will take a screenshot. Now you're going to see it open in Firefox. And it'll be an exact screenshot of whatever's on that compromised machine currently. So there we go. We can see it. All right, other things we can do, um, we could, you know, dump hashes. Uh, I, we could start a key logger. Uh, we could use time stomp to, you know, modify uh, modified access and created time on files. Uh, there's lots of things. And you can always do like I just did and type help. And as you can see, as I'm highlighting here, you know, there's many different uh, types of things you can do here. So, for example, uh, if you look at the top of this list, one of the things that I find pretty cool is the the uh, keystroking or the keylogging feature here. So, if we start that keylogging process, all right, it tells us it started. 
So now if we were to go over to and play the victim on the uh, Windows 7 host now, let's just open uh, Notepad or something. What we see is whatever we type here. So let's say InfoSec rocks. Uh, let's make it make a stronger statement. Better InfoSec rules is what we're going to say there. Yeah. So that's better. All right. So you know it doesn't matter whatever they're typing because we got the keystroke monitoring piece of the Meterpreter shell running. It captured the keystrokes. Now it's not going to populate those for you immediately. We have to actually tell it to dump those to the screen or to a file and then we can actually see what the person was typing on the victim machine. Alright, so if we give it that command notice right there we can see um, the text that the victim was typing on his machine at the time that we had the key scan running. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be like Word or Notepad or anything like that. I mean, even browsing wise, you know, if we were to browse to a website and go to a login field perhaps and try to log in, those keystrokes will be captured by the Meterpreter Shell key scan as well. So if we try to log in here. MSN has been having some problems today, so let's see if it'll let us log in. If not, you know, let's just use Yahoo. And all I'm going to do is simply issue a login. You know, uh, try to log into this website. Uh, there's a hiccup as well. Let's go back. Try to log in the Hotmail. All right, so it looks like we're good here. All right, so I'm just going to simply uh, enter a username and a fake password. All right, so we entered it. And then now if we go back, you know, to and play the attacker again and look at our interpreter shell we can now still see those keystrokes so all we need to do is you know basically tell it to dump those again and we can see those credentials um, that we entered when we tried to log into that website so you know this these are some of the things you can do once you get the shell and again, this is all made possible by DLL hijacking. Um, all the user needs to do is click on or open an SMB share and, and click on a file there. And uh, again, later we'll do another video to show you, you know, several different variations of this. Thanks for watching.